We covered electron dot structures, Lewis structures, following the octet rule, following the octet rule for polyatomic ions, breaking the octet rule, and now we need to bring up resonance structures. And this is a gross oversimplification, but I think it's a pretty good one that we can make use of. And it's gonna carry over into the next couple videos as well. So first of all, if we step outside the world of chemistry for a second, the idea of a resonance is not totally unfamiliar. Maybe you saw it in physics, and maybe you discussed it in music class. We have this idea of resonant frequencies, right? Where there is something that they have in common that allows them to interact but then there is something that is different. So for our purposes, resonance structures are going to be when we have multiple, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, equivalent structures. And that's not the world's greatest definition, I'm not gonna lie, but I will tell you it's very good for our purposes, okay? Here is the deal. We have things that are called localized electron models and delocalized electron models. Lewis structures that we've been drawing are what we call a localized electron model. All right, And to be localized means that something is in a specific location, right? I don't wanna over or undersimplify that, but if you look, for instance, at um, diatomic hydrogen, you would say that in a Lewis structure, the electrons are, right, somewhere in that place. If we then look at the idea of a delocalized electron model, things get more complicated. we have electrons that are not limited to the space between two atoms. All right, so if we have more things present, then those electrons can be spread out over more things. And an example we can use for now that doesn't require resonance for our drawing might be something like CO2, where you have carbon and oxygen and oxygen. And in this particular case, the localized model is pretty accurate. These electrons really are here, and these electrons really are here. But in the big picture, the electrons are all spread out. Okay, and again, stepping on that a little bit. So here's the problem. Delocalized models are very confusing because they don't put things in a specific place. So it's kind of hard to draw. Lewis structures put things in a very specific place. So that makes them easy to draw and understand. However, uh, reality sometimes needs to be represented more closely. And we do that using these resonance structures. A classic example of that would be something like the nitrite polyatomic ion NO2- or ozone, the ozone molecule. You may have heard of the ozone layer. So what we're going to have to do, and I'm going to leave a little bit of space here uh, so that I can write something when I need to, but I'm going to look at ozone, O3. And in this particular case, we have three oxygens bonded together, no charge. So I'll draw my oxygen. Group 16, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? I'm gonna draw another oxygen. And it doesn't really matter where we put these in relation to each other, because this is still just a Lewis structure. All right, now a lot of people would like to finish off this ozone structure as um, a triangle. I kind of drew it in such a way that the triangle would not be an obvious choice, but it wouldn't happen. There's some factors at play, like if you have 45, 45, 90 triangle or whatever, those bond angles are too small and there's too much repulsion, so it's a very unstable species. So you don't end up with a lot of triangular species in chemistry um, because of those steric factors, the shape stuff. So I'm gonna rule that out, and I visually ruled it out by not putting them in an obvious way. So we need to then address the fact of like, this has eight, good. This has seven, not good. This has seven, not good. And so we just need to start playing around. There is an art to drawing Lewis structures, and part of that art is making stuff up. So I'm gonna say, all right, well, what if? What if I used one of these electrons to bond? So I'm gonna take that electron, and I'm gonna take that electron and make a bond. 
That's good for oxygen, 2, 4, 6, 8. That's less good for oxygen, 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And this oxygen didn't change, 2, 4, 6, 7. But I want you to consider for a moment that this now has an extra electron, and it can't break the octet rule because it's in period 2 of the periodic table. It doesn't have a D sublevel. So we're going to need to get rid of that extra electron. The good news is we have a place that needs an electron, and that is over there. All right, so as you look at this, you see that there are now eight. There are eight, and there are eight. And let me redraw this a little cleaner, and we're going to retell the story. Oxygen, we'll just say that's on this side. Double bond oxygen, dot, 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 right? Oxygen, dot, 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 dot. All right, so there's what we have. Now, as I was telling this story, I said that this electron and this electron formed a bond. Well, by that same reasoning, couldn't this electron and this electron have formed a bond? First of all, if that happened, then the central oxygen, and I'll draw that just so I can cross it out, if that had happened, dot, dot, and uh, dot. So if that had happened, this and this could have formed a bond. Then if we said, oh, this and this are going to form a bond, we run into trouble because now that oxygen doesn't have nine like it did for a little while here. It has ten. Two, four, six, eight, ten. And oxygen can't break the octet rule. So that would be real bad. Okay? I'm going to cross that out just so we've eliminated that option as well. Once again, as I was telling this story, this electron and this electron made the bond. Couldn't this electron and this electron have made a bond? And then this electron been given here? And I know in the back of your head you're saying that's exactly the same thing, dummy. And that's because all of these oxygens look the same to you because they're oxygens, when in fact each one is a distinct and separate atom, and they all happen to be oxygen atoms, right? It's kind of like students. If I have three students sitting in the front row, they are unique and different, but they are all students and they are all equal, right? So it doesn't seem fair, again, as we're implying anthropomorphic qualities here, it doesn't seem fair that this oxygen was given an electron and then this oxygen had to share an electron. So in telling this story, I'm going to have to give the other scenario, which is that this, this oxygen here got the double bond by sharing, and then this oxygen here got the extra electron, and we ended up with that. And what we've drawn here is a resonance structure. It's brackets like we would do for charges. It has a double arrow, which is a little misleading at a glance. Um, and it's showing us these things. Now, if we were to look at the data, and this is where things get very interesting, this does not exist, and this does not exist. All right? <clears throat> and why draw them? Well, that's because we're going to have to put a Band-Aid on our Lewis structures, all right? So neither of these things exist. All right. The reason we have to draw it this way, though, is because resonance structures are a band-aid on a localized model so that we can represent delocalized things. There are not two electrons here and four electrons here. There are not four electrons here and two electrons here. They are delocalized. They're spread out. So what are we really saying? Well, we're saying that the data tells us we expect to have some bonds, one single bond, and one double bond, right? <clears throat> and so let me try this out. One single bond and one double bond. In reality, the data shows that we have two bonds of equal length. So this one would be longer, shorter, all right? The data shows we have two bonds of equal length. And the reason that's doubly interesting is because it is not the length of a single bond, and it is not the length of a double bond.
In fact, the data shows that the length is somewhere in between a single bond and a double bond. And you might be able to see where this is going. These two bonds of equal length have a length between a single and double bond. What we actually have in this particular case is two 1.5 bonds. And I say that quickly to kind of step on that terminology. But so we actually have zero single bonds, zero double bonds, but we have two, and I'll put it in quotes, 1.5 bonds. How do you show a 1.5 bond? I don't know. You don't. How do you draw a one and a half bond? We don't. What a resonance structure is, is actually the average of what you're seeing. Okay? So our resonance structures are actually averages of what's shown. Neither structure exists, and I do want to put this in, in some highly visible color. Neither structure exists. What does exist is the average. So the average of two and one is one and a half, and we call that a one and a half bond order. So I'm going to draw an arrow down there because we have two one and a half bonds. So let's put some words in up here where I promised we would. So resonance. is a way to show delocalized electrons on Lewis structures. All right. And I know you may be saying to yourselves, like, <clears throat> why don't we just draw a delocalized electron model? And the answer is because it's a lot more complicated. All right. Some things are conveniently simple. And it's easier to do them and learn small band-aids, some exceptions, as opposed to using something that's significantly more complicated. So in this case, resonance is how we do that. It is a huge misconception in high school and as kids go into chemistry, especially organic chemistry, that we have a situation where this is going back and forth between these two things. No, that's not the case at all. Neither of those things exists. This does not and this does not. What exists is the average of those things a one and a half bond on each side because there's not four here and there's not two here there's three here and three here essentially but they're delocalized over the whole thing off in this space here before I end our introduction to resonance I do want to sneak in another vocabulary term that has to do with that right there what we're talking about is bond order which I will affectionately abbreviate B-O, because it's hilarious, not because it's a legit science abbreviation. We talk about single bonds and we talk about double bonds, but if they're delocalized, we don't have single and double. We have a bond order, which is some effective number of bonds between two atoms in a compound. So in the case we have here, we had three bonds for these two attached atoms, and that is a one and a half. So that's how we're going to calculate bond order. Our bond order is going to be our number of bonds over, I always say, the number of locations. But you may prefer, like, the number of attached atoms and uh, in this particular case here, we would have calculated three bonds with two locations. And what we actually have are two one and a half bonds. So this term bond order is going to be a vocabulary term that com comes up as we look at resonance for some other structures. I will add as a quick postscript here, how do you know when you need to draw a resonance structure? 
And the answer to that is when you have multiple seemingly equivalent options. And I do realize in the big picture that not all resonance structures have equal weighting, and we'll look at some examples of that stuff. But for right now, how do you know when you're going to need resonance? The answer is when you have a situation like this where you could have done something else, all right? then those electrons are not going to be locked to one place. One thing is not going to be preferable over the other. Things are going to average out in terms of those electron locations. So remember, watch for resonance when you've got options.